Lots of very interesting little dramas playing out today in New York. And a lot of them have to do with the fact that um, you had this big redistricting effort. And so now you have totally new districts that have been drawn. And it has thrown the whole thing into total chaos. And now you have a bunch of these um, primaries that are happening today, which are like, you know, established Democratic incumbent versus incumbent and uh, progressives versus corporate, all sorts of storylines that are playing out right now. So let's start with the first one that we actually have covered this one a little bit before. So in this um, district, it's New York 10. It's like lower Manhattan and part of Brooklyn. You've got Dan Goldman, who is the heir to the Levi Strauss fortune. (laughs) And he also uh, became known in like resistance lib circles because he was the lawyer on the first Trump impeachment. And he is the more sort of uh, centrist, moderate, corporate candidate. And then he is up against um, a number of uh, of individuals who position themselves as being the sort of progressive in the race. You have um, Yulene Nu, who is, I think, seems to be uh, leading the pack in terms of the sort of progressive mm-hmm. side of the race. You also have uh, Mondaire Jones, who, of course, was— uh, but is a squad member, and there's an interesting thing that happened with him, too, because he was living in a different district and sort of representing a different district. Then when they did all this redistricting, Sean Patrick Maloney, who's the head of the DCCC, basically bigfooted him, came in and announced, I'm going to run for this district now, and sorry, Mondaire Jones, like, you're screwed. Mondaire Jones decided, all right, well, I'm going to go and try to run in this other New York City district, even though he didn't really live there. And so that's, I think, created issues for him. So bottom line is you have Dan Goldman versus a bunch of progressives who seem to be splitting the vote at this point. And very likely, based on the limited public polling that we have, that Goldman ultimately prevails. So the poll that we have out of um, PIX11, Emerson College and The Hill, conducted from August 10th to August 13th, before Goldman was actually endorsed by the New York Times under very shady circumstances where they failed to reveal their uh, direct conflict of interest with Mr. Goldman, uh, he was at 22% support. Then you had Yulene Nu, who's an assembly member that represents the district and has a strong base of support in the district already, at 17% in second place. Um, she's running with the support of the Working Families Party and local progressive elected officials. Then you had uh, Carlina Rivera at 13%, uh, who also has some local elected officials, political clubs, and labor groups. And then you have also Mondaire Jones also at 13%. So It's a bit of a wide open race, especially since you have very limited public polling. But as I said, it kind of looks like what happened here is the left didn't get their act together. They didn't consolidate behind one candidate. And so you're very, it's very possible that Dan Goldman ultimately wins Mm -hmm. this one. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Goldman in particular, right, is just like the perfect commentary on where exactly that we are today. Like the multimillionaire Yale lawyer who is famous for literally only one reason, and that is, you know, trying to impeach Donald Trump and not even actually succeeding in doing so. Right. And yet, they're like, he prosecuted his case so effectively. It's like, well, he didn't win. So I don't you know, it doesn't seem like that much of a victory to me. However, turned himself into a legitimate hero. Now he wants to be a congressman. I mean, who doesn't, right? It's a nice job, apparently. And so he's tur- now he's uh, at the very top of this primary. He got the New York Times to endorse him. Trump himself even endorsed oh, him, that's which is right. hilarious. Tongue in cheek. Yeah, yeah, Trump was he gave a tongue. He's like, I fully endorse Dan, Dan Goldman. Goldman. He's like, my, he has my complete and total endorsement. And they're like, this is a ploy by Donald Trump and like why we have to throw him in jail immediately. And actually his opponents were using it against him, which I do think is uh, pretty humorous. Yeah. In I mean, general. I would too. Look, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, screw this guy. Fine. I, look, I think he's probably going to win, unfortunately. I mean, he'll be what? A replacement level, like Dem resistance. Standard, like totally standard issue, forgettable Dem congressman. That's right. what he will be. The Acela just got a new customer. Now, I do want to say like, it is yeah. far from certain that he ends up prevailing here just because we do have really limited polling. It's hard to, you know, figure out what exactly is going to happen. And as I said, it it seems like of the progressives, um, Yulene Nu, uh, who right now represents sort of around the Chinatown area, is, uh, is, seems to have the strongest support. So we'll see. There still is some drama here as to how it ultimately plays out. But it's looking like it's shaking out that the progressives divided the vote and amongst themselves and allowing Mr. Goldman with his Levi Strauss 
Fortune, who will be one of the wealthiest members of Congress, which does something. It's wow. a wealthy group out there. Congratulations. Um, yeah. If he ultimately gets elected. Okay, so that's the first one. The second one is, <laughs> this is a really interesting one. So they used to have districts that one of them was sort of like centered in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. The other one was centered in the Upper East Side. The Upper West Side was Jerry Nadler. The Upper East Side was Carolyn Maloney. Well, they decided instead to sort of like divide the city in half and have the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side in one district. And now you have Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney, both of whom are very senior members of the Democratic caucus, going up against each other. And there's a third candidate in the race as well, Siraj Patel, who's previously challenged Carolyn Maloney and actually came very, very close to defeating her. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of there was actual election ballot issues in that race that may have denied him victory ultimately. But so you've got a three-way race here. As far as I can tell, I think it's more likely that either Nadler or Maloney prevails. They seem to be getting most of the media attention here, although Siraj Patel is doing his damnedest to try to break through. But it has gotten ugly <laughs> between Maloney and Nadler, yes. who are, you know— colleagues and I presume have had a decent relationship throughout the years. Let's go ahead and put this Mediate article up on the screen. Carolyn Maloney says, uh, you know, that these reporters should check out a New York Post editorial about uh, about Jerry Nadler. She says they call him senile. They cite his performance at the debate where he couldn't even remember who he impeached. He said he impeached Bush. So the actual quote from the Post editorial board was that Nadler during the August 10th debate, quote, exposed himself as this close to senile by saying he impeached former President George W. Bush. Um, he was attempting to reference his vote to impeach former President Donald Trump. Carolyn Maloney has also made some very eyebrow-raising comments in this race that may call into question her own uh, mental state. And these are both, you know, relatively older people that we're talking about here with regards to Maloney and Nadler. First in a debate, they were both asked, every, everybody on the stage was asked, you know, would you support President mm -hmm. Biden? Nadler basically dodges. And she says, it's my understanding he's not running again, to which everyone was like, wait, what? Siraj Patel has tried to make hay out of the fact that, um, you know, neither one of them sort of just affirmatively backed Biden. Then in her interview with the New York Times editorial board, they ask her this again. And she says, off the record, it's not. it's my understanding he's not running yes. again. And they're like, that's not how an editorial board interview works. They're like, no, this is on, on the, the record. record. <laughs> it's all on the record. And she's like, oh, then, you know, I we'll, we'll see what happens or something like right. that. So anyway, um, they're not sending their best, but it's uh, been an interesting sort of mudslinging fight between these two incumbents and with Siraj Patel as, listen, you never know when, because things get ugly between the top two contenders, someone sneaks through. So I guess that's the case for him. It's certainly possible. Uh, no idea. Schumer, yeah. actually, it was interesting to me that Schumer came in and outright endorsed just because Maroney and Schumer are, I mean, sorry, Maroney and Nadler are both, you know, like New York war horses. They're like very old. They've been around for decades. Been around for Ever. on the scene. So I yeah. think the fact that the Times, I mean, I guess the Times coming in and Schumer actually coming in for Nadler was the biggest surprise. And I actually think it might've been a move by the White House and by Dem leadership against Carol Mar Maroney where they're like, hey, you should have kept your mouth shut yeah. about Joe Biden. They're like, and if you're not going to toe oh, the line, they're like, we're going to knife you, now, not even knife you in the back, we'll stab you in the front I, it was, for, for crossing us. It like was this. shocking. Right. That, well, I mean, Nadler didn't back him either though. I mean, right. it was. this is shocking. This really is shocking because- Biden is the incumbent president, and these are, this is a deep blue district. They're, the Republican doesn't stand a chance. So it's not like you see some of these centrist types who don't want to say mm -hmm. how they feel about Biden. In fact, um, in one of the upstate, like, sort of swing seats that is uh, up today as well, the candidate there was like, I, I don't want to say whether I back Biden. Now, wow. that, yeah. you can see the political logic yes, because yes, they're yes. trying to win over Republicans. Biden's deeply unpopular. Okay, I see what's going on there. Here, there's not a lot of, like, political logic mm -hmm. behind not supporting Biden. And to have two senior members of the Democratic caucus who hold, you know, relatively senior, like, leadership positions because they've been there for so damn long, to have both of them be like, eh, I'm not really going to dive into that. I don't really want to say. That's pretty extraordinary. Very interesting there. So I don't know what's going to come of that. I will say, having been around, I've been around both Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney. Mm -hmm. It might be a low bar, but I would say he is uh, more cogent than she is if we're going to go down the who's more senile uh, yeah, fair. route. Right. <laughs>
<laughs> when you're talking about but, uh, eight-year-olds, yeah. it's all slim pickings. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so the next one that uh, is interesting that I referenced earlier is New York Times 17. Let's go ahead and put this one up on the screen. So they say this is the New York primary being watched by AOC, Pelosi, and the Clintons. All right, Sean Patrick Maloney. Um, who I think many of his colleagues would agree is a tremendous asshole. Um, They, after, immediately after the new district lines were announced, he jumps in and basically Bigfoots Mondaire Jones in the district that Mondaire, you know, represents the bulk of and is like, I'm going to run here. And the reason that he did it is because it's a slightly bluer district Mm -hmm. than the one that it would have been logical for him to run in. So he jumps into this race because he thinks this is an easier path for me to get back into into Congress. Now, the other thing that is really obnoxious about that and (laughs) really sort of pathetic is the fact that um, Sean Patrick Maloney is actually in charge of the Democrats' efforts to hold the House. So if he is not even confident enough in his ability to win in a Biden seat that I think is like Biden plus seven or something, the one that would have been logical for him to run in, and he wants to jump right. over to this one that's like Biden plus 11, kind of a pathetic sign of how things are going under his leadership of Democrats' attempts to hold the House. So anyway, that all shakes out. Mondair Jones goes and runs in the district we already talked about. But Sean Patrick Maloney does face a challenger from from the left, he's a very centrist corporate Democrat, um, Alessandra Biaggi, who's kind of a rising star in terms of the uh, Democratic left. Now, you've got uh, Maloney backed by Pelosi, backed by Bill Clinton, and this is, I think, the district that Chappaqua is mm-hmm. in. It's like Westchester County and the Hudson Valley. Um, Alessandra Biaggi, who is a state senator, she defeated a, uh, kind of came out of nowhere, defeated a powerful incumbent in 2018, so that gave her a big footprint. She has the support of AOC and some other, uh, a bunch of progressive organizations, Working Family Par- Families Party and things like that. Now, I think Biaggi has struggled to raise money. Sean Patrick Maloney has been awash in cash. He's been up on the airwaves. She hasn't been. All indications are that he kind of has this thing sewed up. So it looks like his ploy is going to work. And also, yeah, Westchester County and Hudson Valley, these are not leftist. Yeah, exactly. These are not leftist areas. I'm sure there are plenty of progressives there, um, especially among younger people. But this is more, I mean, this is Hillary Clinton- turf. She won this district over Bernie Sanders. They're comfortable with her type of politics. The only reason she's staying out of this, she actually, I think, officiated um, Biagi's wedding, but they made sure to get the husband involved to signal where the Clinton's heart really lies. So um, that's what that one looks like. Again, with these primaries, you never know. She could pull off a shocking upset, an AOC-type upset win over Sean Patrick Maloney. But um, the sort of fundraising disparity alone augurs against that outcome actually occurring. It's not not looking good uh, necessarily. But again, you know, here's the other thing too, unfortunately. It's not like we can just tell you exactly what happened because it takes weeks in order to count votes in the state of New York, which is insane. Yes. I think the most noteworthy thing, as you were saying, about Patrick Maloney is that he was the DCCC head and still outright just knifed one of his own colleagues yeah. when his own neck was on the line, which, you know, probably not collegial Well, and at best. also, you're the guy who supposedly, like, knows how to win in these swing yes. districts, and but you're, like, terrified of, you know, a, an actually swing district. You you can't even put yourself in that right. sort of jeopardy. It's it's pathetic, oh, ultimately. Totally. And yesterday, he literally yesterday, was on Fox, and they were like, hey, do you uh, see the moral problem with running against threats to democracy? And and then spending millions of dollars behind Republicans who are pro stop the steal in GOP primaries, he said, "No, we have a moral imperative to do so, so that we can defeat them." Oh my so God. literally yesterday. Wow. Uh, so maybe voters there will take notice. Although something tells me that they're of the cringe variety who probably love something. Yeah. Well, Biagi has tried to make you know make a lot out of that, yeah. and you know Good. especially right, and which yeah. is logical. And I think a lot of just mainline like liberal Democrats were also upset mm-hmm. about this move. So that has been one of her attacks on Sean. Patrick Maloney, but again, she she has not had the money to be on the airwaves, so that makes it difficult to make the case. She also the adds um, a bunch of money from the uh, what is it called the Fraternal Police Organization. Yes. The, the police union have come in against her because mm. of her comments about defunding the police, and so that has been up on the airwaves, sort of defining her. 
but she hasn't really been able to respond, at least in paid communication. So that's the way that one is shaking out. I do want to mention, too, uh, tomorrow we don't normally have a show. Yes. But I'm going to interview Dan Marins of uh, The Huffington Post, who uh, is really deeply knowledgeable and has been following all of these primaries um, in, you know, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary detail. He actually has an article up right now about Sean Patrick Maloney and uh, Alessandra Biaggi. So I'm going to talk to him tomorrow so you'll get to get whatever we know about these primaries, right. <laughs> whether they have been called yet or not. We'll have a reaction uh, video. It'll be here on the channel for premium subs. Of course, we'll email it to you. And I, if, if it's long enough, we'll make it available on the podcast feed too to everybody. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.